hope everybody can see the screen now. Yes, it works. Great, thank you. And good morning, everybody. Although I realize it's not uh, the morning for everybody who's joined. Um, the uh, good thing about online seminars, you can join from just about anywhere. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about this morning is the Connected Network, which is a community network for African vector-borne uh, plant viruses. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the kind of, the, the way that we pulled it together, um, the kind of activities uh, that we host within the network and the kind of purpose behind it. I'll give you some examples of, of all of the different activities um, that we're involved in. I think to begin with, I should give um, a couple of acknowledgements. Firstly, to the funder, this was uh, funded by the BBSRC, um, which is a UK funding agency, and it was funded through their program, the Global Challenges Research Fund or GCRF. And predominantly in, in the first instance, this was a um, collaboration between the University of Bristol and Newcastle University. Um, but as you'll see as, as the, the, the talk goes along, um, there's been so much involvement from so many people, it's impossible really uh, to prov provide adequate um, acknowledgements for everybody. I should also acknowledge that the University of Bristol um, in particular has, has also supported uh, the programme significantly uh, financially. So who are we and what do we do? So Connected is a network of international scientists and researchers who all have a common interest in the challenges uh, brought by vector-borne plant viruses in Africa. And the aim of the network is to provide a collaborative, uh, multidisciplinary approach uh, to tackling vector-borne diseases. And I suppose our aim really, in the first instance, we saw an interesting niche there that we have a lots of people around the world working on vectors and insects and entomology, lots of people working on plant viruses. We have a relatively smaller number working on both. And we figured if we could pull everybody together into a network, um, that that would provide some benefits. So we would get the entomologist's input, we would get the virologist's input, and then we would be stronger together. And underneath I've written the, the kind of initial activities that we envisage. So we envisage from the outset that we would uh, fund some research and that that research would be for initiating uh, collaborations. Uh, this caused a little bit of anxiety because UK Africa collaborations, it says there, and of course the, the money came from the, the UK government, uh, hence the uh, UK collaborations. Uh, we were interested in training um, and springboarding early career researchers. Now, the focus on early career researchers came uh, later once the project had really started, and I'll come on to that later. And then providing network um, activity and also resource provision. So one of the things that you can access now through Connected are a lot of resources about vector-borne diseases. So like all good organizations, we've got a vision and a mission. Our vision is pretty um, straightforward, I suppose, um, where there's a world without, where existing and emerging vector-borne plant viruses are swiftly detected, combated and defeated using sustainable solutions to ensure fair, nutritious and sustainable food production for everybody. And our mission is to use research training and networking to equip an international multidisciplinary network of researchers to fight insect um, born plant viruses that devastate crops worldwide. And in doing so, reduce poverty, malnutrition and food security and engage with policymakers, stakeholders and end users to raise awareness and enable evidence-based decision-making. Now, I suppose when I start, when we, when we really started this uh, network, I, this was the first project of this kind that I'd been involved in. And I, was, I guess I was kind of wondering, um, you know, what kind of activities might we do? I'd predominantly really been involved in research projects up to then where, you know, you very much focus on the research. You do some engagement, dissemination activities outside of that. And this 
starting this project and then working with a whole range of professionals in this area kind of opened the door to me of how, um, you know, effectively a project that isn't a research project could still deliver so much um, and could, could be so multifaceted and have so many different types of activities within it. So in the outset, um, like, like many uh, projects, there was a call. So the BBSRC released a call. Lots of people in the community uh, kind of read that call and it was quite broad. It was talking about uh, vector-borne diseases in the round. So not just plants, but animals, humans, zoonotics. And, you know, we figured up against the competition of people working on animal diseases um, and uh, human diseases, we would need uh, quite a strong consortia and quite a lot of support. And so we tried to be quite inclusive here um, and involve as many people as we could, because we figured probably, you know, within that field, we did, weren't sure exactly how many networks would get funded, but there's probably not going to be very many, four or five, turned out to be four in the end, and one of them was a plant virus network, uh, which is what we were looking for. And so to pull all of that together, um, you know, quite a lot of email traffic in the early days of people who were interested. And myself, uh, Sue Seal from the University of Greenwich, Gary Foster from the University of Bristol, um, decided that, you know, we would, we would go for this, we would make a network, and we started to invite people um, to join the network and, and indeed start uh, writing a proposal and scoping out what we might achieve. I'll come back to a roadmap of, of how that then went, but to begin with, what I wanted to talk through with the various teams of people involved. And so this is the main team based at Bristol. Um, and this is, is, this is the team that really make uh, Connected run and make uh, Connected happen. And this is current and in a couple of cases, previous um, team members. But if I start on the right hand side, got uh, Nina Ockerden powell who's the network manager, along with Diane Hurd, who's uh, the other network manager. This is Gary Foster, who's the other director for the network. Uh, Sonia, who's our exec assistant. And then the communication officers that have changed partway through the project. Uh, so for much of the project, um, we worked with Richard Wyatt here, and now um, Heather Child has joined us um, as a communication officer. Now, one of the things that was that was a real eye opener for me in this project um, was this bringing together uh, a team of specialists like this. Normally, in a research project, you know, you expect to do some communication dissemination. You obviously have to manage the project, manage the finances, and all of these kind of things. Now, normally, that's done by the scientists within the uh, project, and I'm not going to lie to you. Often that can be a little bit chaotic. Um, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And, you know, often things like communications and management are not the skills that you get when you employ lots of research scientists. Here, we were able to, you know, appoint lots of professionals. So um, people who could professionally manage the network, professional communication officers, and professional assistants. And that made a massive difference to how this run um and you know really was the reason why this ne uh, network has been so successful you know i suppose it makes perfect sense you know you 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 employ professionals uh, to do things and you get really good outputs and that's been a real eye opener for me and i think you know if i pull together big research projects again in the future i would aim to you know where possible to try to 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 build teams a bit more like this um, rather than just trying to, you know, kind of share out those jobs amongst the researchers within a consortia. So that's been a real lessons learned for me. It's not always possible in all research projects to do that. Um, you probably need a project of a, of a pretty decent size uh, to be able to fund it, but it's absolutely worthwhile. Moving on to the management board then, um, this was something that was really important both 
uh, for us pulling it together, uh, but also um, in review um, when we were interviewed uh, by this project, uh, you know, we were specifically asked how we managed to pull together um, such an impressive management board. And this was calling on lots of favours, I suppose, ultimately, uh, from collaborators past and present of uh, both myself, uh, Gary and Sue, and also, you know, once you start inviting a couple of people, asking those people who else we should bring on board. And it was really important to us that we had uh, stakeholders, not just in the UK, um, but also in Africa, so that we could cover both aspects of what the call, uh, what they were looking for, and also in different parts of Africa, both in East Africa, West Africa, and also different types of organizations. So from the CG centers uh, to the national programs, and indeed, in some cases, universities. Um, so we wanted to pull together that kind of diversity um, of different organizations into our management board. And we were lucky enough to have Nicola Spence, who's the Chief Plant Health Officer for the UK, uh, for a fair amount of this project as our chair. And Lava Kumar, who's uh, I'm showing the picture of here, uh, Lava was the, the uh, co-chair with Nicola. And uh, Nicola's uh, done her time on our board now and has resigned from the board and Lava has taken over um, as the chair of the board. So, you know, we provided that kind of um, succession planning uh, within the board. And, you know, I'll come on to what the management board does for us um, in a couple of slides time. But that's our management board. You can see it's quite large and quite diverse. And then onto our network, which I think on a current count is uh, close to 1500 people um, from 85 different countries. And whilst the project started with a focus in Africa, uh, because that was what the call asked for, um, the network has spread uh, much more broadly than that um, around the world. Um, I guess perhaps showing, um, you know, a need for a network of this kind uh, to bring such a diversity of researchers and other participants together. So I put this slide in just to kind of, I've talked through the different people involved, but just to kind of give you an idea of how it all fits together. Um, so I talked about the connected team based predominantly at Bristol. Um, I talked about the management board and our members, and this is kind of how it fits together. So as I mentioned, you know, the driving force behind the project is really the connected team. Um, these are the people that, um, in many cases, dream up the activities, um, dream, uh, develop the content of the activities, along with collaborators, and then make sure those activities are delivered. Now, of course, you know, we could sit in Bristol as a team, dream up all of these things uh, that we think are really exciting and just deliver them um, and hope that they're useful for our network members. Um, but I've got some other arrows here. That's what our management board is predominantly for, to keep us on the straight and narrow. It's our first port of call um, to run past a group of people, the kind of activities uh, that we're gonna be developing, because obviously we're spending a lot of money here. We don't want to just kind of dream up things that sound good to us. We want to some professional input into that from a range of uh, different people, a big diversity of people to say, yes, those are the kinds of things uh, that would be useful in this field. Um, and, you know, these are the things you should go ahead with. And these are the things that we're not so sure about. Um, so, you know, the management board really kept us on the straight and narrow uh, in terms of, of good, um, I guess, good governance, really, uh, ensuring that the money was well spent um, through the uh, project. And then also the network members. So, you know, it's really important to engage with the members and say, well, okay, what kind of activities do you want to? Because again, you know, these two groups of people, you know, taking a top-down approach can think, well, this is the kind of things that we could deliver. Yes, that's a good idea, deliver that. Is it useful to the members? Is it what they're looking for? Is that why they joined uh, Connected? Uh, so there's backwards and forwards with the network members. 
And I'll come on to some of the early activities in a minute. And then in the middle are the activities that we developed. So whether that's research, training, outreach, uh, some of the resources that are available, um, all of those are the activities that are delivered for the benefit of the members uh, and the members get involved in them. Now, I'm ensured here, you know, this isn't a linear, this isn't something the connected team deliver these activities to the members. There's quite a lot of backwards and forwards. Um, you know, our team is quite small. Um, we can't deliver all of the materials and we draw on an awful lot of members um, to feed into these activities and deliver these activities. Um, and you'll see how that panned out much later on. So I've just got a couple of slides now just to think through the kind of subject area. Um, Vector-borne disease, what is it? What are the impacts? Um, so vector-borne disease, uh, reduced productivity, affect human health and disrupt ecosystems uh, throughout the world. And they profoundly restrict socioeconomic status and development in countries with the highest rate of infection, many of which are located in the tropics and subtropics. So these are a kind of issues that really affect agriculture worldwide, but I think the biggest impact is found in the tropics and the subtropics. Um, and that's partly to do with the kind of diversity of vectors and the environment driving those vectors, the availability of control measures, and also the crops and the viruses. Um, and that means that it's, you know, effectively worse. Uh, and these, these diseases uh, have a bigger impact in the tropics and the subtropics. And these are the, just some of the crops that are impacted. Um, I mean, they impact effectively all of the common crops um, across the region. So here we're talking now about sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so that's the major and the minor crops. But we have to remember and be mindful here that in cropping systems, um, many of these crops in combination play a role. Um, so we're not just talking about, say, um, you know, what might be common in the sort of global north where we might have maize monocultures. Um, you know, often in sub-Saharan Africa, we've got cropping systems uh, where we, we're intercropping a lot of different crops together uh, to provide the diversity of uh, nutrition that we need, but also providing resilience and in some cases, effective measures for controlling pests and diseases. Um, and interestingly, something that's now becoming um, more broadly revisited in other agriculture systems, certainly in the UK, many of these topics are now uh, gaining, or many of these approaches, sorry, are gaining traction um, in UK uh, arable agriculture, having been missing from it for probably um, several hundred years. And there's also a role for neglected crops um, because these may be better adapted to changing conditions um, and they often have untapped potential as we've invested all of our efforts into um, some of the bigger crops such as maize and cassava, rice and wheat. Then what about some of these minor crops? You know, there's good examples here, land races of crops such as maize, uh, we've got things like millet, taro, uh, ground nuts, things that, you know, right now perhaps um, aren't widely grown, but could be more widely grown and could be developed in the same way that some of the other bigger crops that we often think of, about uh, could be grown. And this was kind of interesting for Connected because clearly there's a lot of activity um, in terms of research funding focused on some of these uh, bigger crops. Um, so things like maize, cassava, yams, etc. So, you know, would these neglected crops be something that Connected could um, make an active contribution towards? And I suppose, you know, you can't really talk about agriculture without thinking about climate change. Um, and in particular, the impacts that climate change will have um, and the changes that might have in terms of agricultural productivity. And so the image here that I've shown, um, you know, the, the color scale is the change in agricultural productivity predicted as a result of climate change. 
Um, so what we're talking about in sub-Saharan Africa, mainly rain-fed agricultural systems. And so we would expect that, you know, that's where some of the biggest impacts are going to be too. Um, so you can see a lot of the red, dark red colouring um, impacting sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and perhaps a lot of, you know, reflected in the membership of Connected, a lot of other countries uh, where we draw members from, um, recognising that, you know, climate change is going to continue uh, to be one of the biggest drivers of problems around uh, agriculture in the coming decades. So in terms of a roadmap of where we are and the kinds of activities that we've done so far, activities that we continue to do, um, and how they're kind of laid out in time. So this was the starting point of our project. You know, our first job was employ the team, um, which we did uh, very early on. And then our first activities uh, to get started with were launch events uh, in UK and also in Africa. Now the launch events are really important because what we were trying to do uh, was bring together lots of stakeholders um, and you know, to improve the diversity of the stakeholders by holding them in different locations, such that we could get a good initial steer on what we should be doing in this project. So, as I mentioned, you know, obviously we wrote a proposal, we had to say what we would do in this project. So, you know, we knew that we would do training, we knew that we would do some research, we knew that we would do some dissemination activities. But what about the shape of these? You know, what kind of training? Who are we training? You know, what kind of research, what focus should it have? You know, should it be one big research project, lots of small research projects? All of these are questions for the key stakeholders. And so these launch events were a really big deal for this project in terms of shaping all of the activities that would come afterwards. We also were quite time limited. So we knew it was important to launch the first pump prime funding fairly soon after the uh, launch events. So as soon as we had a good idea, um, you know, could we start to get money out of the door and um, fund some research projects? And then onto the training and onto the outreach. Uh, so we started to um, deliver training um, that was predominantly in-person training and some of the outreach activities. And I'll come on to those in a bit more detail later on. But then you'll notice that this bend in the road here, this was COVID and a lot of our activities became online activities. Now, before then, we hadn't really, I suppose, envisaged that much online activity. Um, like everybody else, it was very new to us. And that wouldn't be the case if we were doing this all over again. Um, because what we found is that online training enables us to reach a much larger um, cohort of people who want training. Now, it isn't suited for all kinds of training, um, but it's a really important extra tool in our armory. And it's something I think that we will not do without now. Um, and for some training is, you know, probably the best way of delivering it. Um, but for a network like this, it enables us to extend our reach and we can get to many more people um, and do a Again, a diversity, it's much more inclusive. Um, you know, perhaps people who can't travel can access online training. Um, so, you know, whilst COVID was, uh, you know, did impact a lot of our research projects that got started, um, it did ultimately deliver some benefits for us in, in terms of developing online activity. And then later on, train the trainer. Again, I'll mention this later, but you know, this is about project legacy. So, you know, we can only train so many people. And so it was important to us to ensure that we were trying to train people who could then go on to train other people. And we had some specific activities uh, where we focused on identifying trainers, but all the way through, um, we did focus on trying to find people who had the interest and the connections to do ongoing training um, when they returned home. So we, we prioritize those kind of people for the training activities that we delivered. So this is a photo taken from the um, launch event that was 
based in Uganda. And this really helped us to shape um, much of the activity. And it was from this launch event um, that we decided that we should really focus on early career researchers. Um, before then, you know, we'd been shaping what kind of research we might do and what kind of activities we might do. We hadn't thought too much about who we might deliver it to. Um, and, you know, at this event, that really shaped our thinking that there was a gap there to develop a, the, a cohort of scientists, you know, the next generation of scientists who are going to step into um, senior uh, roles um, and that it was that cohort that needed, you know, the most support and the broadest support and that that was something that we would be able to deliver through, through Connected. Um, so it shaped a lot of the activities too, but in the first instance, I think one of the key things was uh, shaping who we would uh, deliver these activities to. So let's think about some of these activities now. Um, so firstly, we funded some research projects. Now we invested about you know, 700,000 pounds in research projects, and we decided to do that predominantly through relatively small pump prime research projects. So there were 20 research projects uh, involving 55 researchers from 33 institutions. Now those numbers are really important because what we were trying to do here was bring together new collaborations and use these pump prime funding to bring together people who had not re really worked together previously. So it's going back to that idea of saying, well, can we bring entomologists and virologists together, you know, and they've not normally worked together, but can we bring them together to provide benefit? And we provide them with money uh, to get off the ground. Now, you know, we realized, you know, these relatively small projects, we're not gonna, um, you know, we're probably not gonna see many papers in nature here, um, but it really, it was about collaborations. Um, that was our focus and also trying to fund teams that involved early career researchers. So we were trying to encourage people to partner early career researchers with more established researchers to give people the opportunity uh, to write a proposal, um, to apply for money, be successful with applying for that money, and then to, to uh, deliver some research. So take people through the project cycle. Um, so we engaged with 14 different countries and 11 different crops. And again, when you look down this list of crops, um, whilst there are projects on maize, cassava, banana, there's also a lot of projects on other much smaller crops. And that was, again, a conscious decision. So what we're trying to focus on, new collaborations, uh, neglected crops, and early career researchers. And all of those projects, um, you can catch up with on the on the connected website and there's posters from all of the output from those has been uh, created and shared with net, network members and indeed i think they're still on the website you can look at them um, just to give you a flavor of some of those both in terms of the teams and the kinds of work uh, so this was a collaboration um, between calro in kenya and cambridge university in the uk and it's the role of poleroviruses in maize lethal necrosis epidemics in Africa. Um, I think this um, wasn't completely a new team of people. I think they'd worked together previously, um, but it was a project that Jane led um, as a relatively early career researcher and getting input there from Alex and John at Cambridge. Um, this was a project based at uh, Greenwich University and also the Kebi State University in Nigeria. Um, in this case, um, it was led by Dr. Aliu Turakai and supported by Gonzalo Silva, who's an early career researcher and mentored in this case by Sue Seal. And they were looking at mealybug vectors involved in the transmission of um, bacilliform viruses in Yam in Northern Nigeria. And they were really the key to this project. You know, this again, this was a new uh, collaboration, but it used um, knowledge coming from Nigeria of the diseases and specialist facilities at the University of Greenwich um, based around insect culture. 
And this is the last one that I'm just going to touch on. Uh, and this was the potential of entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi as biopesticides of cassava whitefly. And this was a collaboration uh, between the University of Warwick and IITA um, in uh, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. So that was James Legg and also the Department of Agriculture uh, at Wesley University in Nigeria. Again, bringing together a diverse team of people um, that hadn't worked together previously um, to look at entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi as a way of controlling cassava whitefly. So again, a different approach um, to looking at a, a, a disease and a problem that's ha had an awful lot of funding, um, but it's still a, a really uh, intractable disease problem. So moving away from research then, another um, really big focus for us was training. Uh, this was again identified in the, in particular in the, the kickoff meeting in uh, Uganda and the types of topics um, that people wanted. So, and this developed into a program of training. So diagnostics and identification. So being able to diagnose diseases and identify the vectors. Um, these were two things that were highlighted as being really uh, key skills that were really important to a lot of the early career researchers engaging with Connected. And so we put in quite a lot of effort in that area. We also found that people wanted to kind of be masters of their own destiny in a way and uh, organize their own tra training visits and courses. Uh, or attend international courses. And so we provided funding for that uh, through a program of uh, things like training vouchers. Now this picture shows the V4 event, um, which was an early career uh, training event at Bristol. And this covered a whole range of different topics, um, which I think I go into a little bit more detail later. This was really the biggest event that we did. It was highly competitive. I think we selected 18 people from about 120 applicants for this uh, program. And the trainers that, that we were able to pull together for this were uh, incredible. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, I think. And then there's the material that's online. So um, soft skills training, uh, this was identified as being important, you know, communications training, this kind of thing. I'll come on to it in a bit more detail. And then cataloging that training material of making it available via the website so that people can access it. So let's go through some of these in a little bit more detail. For diagnostics and identification, we delivered these predominantly uh, through courses in one delivered at Becker in Kenya and one delivered at IOTA in Nigeria. Uh, the reason that we uh, connected with both IOTA and Becker is they're big uh, hubs in, in both East and West Africa. Um, they provided us um, incredible facilities and incredible technical support uh, to enable us to do this, this training. So we had trainers uh, from the UK at each of these events, uh, but also trainers from both IOTA and Becker uh, delivering training. Um, and we were lucky enough to get nearly 20 people to each one, um, 12 different countries represented in uh, Nigeria and 10 in Kenya just a couple of pictures uh, from that and you can see from there you know we we did spend a fair amount of time in the in the lab but we went out into the field um this is lava kumar doing training on uh sampling in the field and storage of samples which is really critical and here you can see gonzalo uh, silver from the university of greenwich um training people in bioinformatics um on the computer now, the V4 training I mentioned before, 18 people from 11 countries. It was a two week residential at Bristol. And, you know, this was our biggest event um, in terms of training. So we covered diagnostics and identification again, both in the lab and the field. You can see some pictures there. Um, Adrian Fox um, doing some lab work there, looking at some virus symptoms and then uh, going on to do uh, analysis. And we were lucky enough to get Simon along to uh, teach some entomology, um, which, you know, again, was one of the last uh, big events that Simon taught her. Um, we also brought in lots of people, you know, broadening 
the kind of stakeholders that are involved. So people talking about plant health and policy and also collaboration and soft skills. And I think the next slide just shows you a list of all of the different people and the locations they came from. I'm not gonna read through the list, but you know, it was incredible that most of these people gave up their time uh, for free uh, to come and train people on this course. Um, you know, they could see the benefits of, of giving up two or three days of their time um, over the two weeks to, to deliver this for us. And it coincided with a big meeting uh, between Greenwich and Bristol. And so we had some international partners along. Uh, so we were lucky enough to get people like Titus who could come along and Justin who could also contribute to the um, delivery of training. So um, as I mentioned, you know, really that was a once in a lifetime uh, opportunity, uh, probably for all of us involved. Um, you know, that was one of the most amazing things I've been involved in uh, during my career. Now onto soft skills. And this was something that, that we delivered in person, but rapidly became online. Uh, so we worked with partners, so we worked with Scriptoria, um, but we also relied very heavily on uh, people like Richard who were delivering a lot of this online. And by doing it online, um, enabled us to do it more frequently um, and Richard caught up with people on a regular basis to do follow-on training, catch up with how they'd use their training and then refine the approaches. So Richard was really driving this forwards for us and talking in particular about the communication skills and things like social media and how you would use those. Um, but as I mentioned, we also did things like grant writing, um, which was identified by the early career re researchers. And we also did uh, research project management. And those were two areas that Scriptoria helped with us uh, delivering enormously. As I mentioned, some people wanted to be masters of their own destiny. So we did some training visits. Uh, 32 early career researchers got training vouchers and they traveled all over the world uh, to either take part in courses or bespoke training. Um, in different locations from South Africa, uh, USA, UK, France, uh, Sweden, you know, basically wherever they wanted to go, uh, they were able to get training vouchers to, to go and do that. And I think next I've got just a video, um, just to, which sort of covers a bit of that training, uh, hearing from some of the people who, who were actually trained. <laughs> So one of the diagnostics techniques that I've learned is RPA, the recombinase polymerase amplification. This is something that is new to me. I never known about it, but we have an instrument which can be used to do RPA at my institute. So through this training, the practical skills that I've learned here, I'll apply them in my work at IIT when I go back to Dar es Salaam in rapid diagnosis of brown streak and mosaic in the field. One of the major things that I have learned is um, uh, especially the methods that are used for uh, viral diagnosis. That's one major take home message for me that I'm going to immediately uh, implement in our laboratory to offer diagnostic services to different stakeholders in the agricultural industry. Experience I've gotten from the extraction of uh, DNA from insects. I can take it back home and also uh, apply it with my research group. So that I'll, I'll teach them how to extract DNA also from insects, do gel electrophoresis and sequencing as well, and how to analyze sequence data. One of the things that I'll actually be able to do better, first and foremost, is diagnostics. Identify the diseases, because we've not, we've been doing this, but uh, not as efficiently and as, or as frequent. So the ability to use this tool will make it easier for us to detect it and then be able to address the challenge which we need in order to deliver clean planting materials to farmers. So with all this... Okay, I'm gonna just skip over the rest of that video just for time and talk about outreach and resources. So this was something, again, that we pulled together or, or different resources that we pulled together 
uh, that everybody can make use of, all of the members. Uh, so here we've got just some infographics that enable people to look at some, um, you know, you could use them as slides, you could print them out and provide them to stakeholders, but providing some key facts for different crops, different diseases, uh, these kind of things. Um, one of the other things uh, that we made use of um, that again was, was really valuable was making videos, which we hadn't done too much uh, before then, but again, something that Richard did for us was make links with a local university um, and the students there who were, who were studying uh, animation. And we ran competitions with them um, to enable them to test their skills, uh, pitching ideas, and delivering material, uh, delivering products to customers. And in this case, we were the customer. And then we would benefit from having uh, these materials that we, again, we could make use of ourselves, but also release through the website to enable uh, people to use. And these materials could be useful in their teaching, um, could be used for, for engaging with different stakeholder groups. I've just got one example here uh, that I'm gonna share. So a short video uh, that was made by students from the University of um, West of England. Connected is equipping a network of African researchers to lead the fight against plant diseases that are spread by insects and which devastate food crops in sub-Saharan African countries. Plant diseases that cause poverty, malnutrition and food insecurity that cause 40% of all crops to be lost with annual losses of $290 billion that know no national borders and on which too little research has been undertaken to find solutions and too little training available to help scientists and farmers fight back. Connected has created training programs which have been delivered in person and online with over 100 training places awarded to people who have then shared their skills with hundreds more right across sub-Saharan Africa. Funded 20 research projects involving 55 researchers in 14 countries focusing on 11 crops, spending over 700,000 pounds. Built a multidisciplinary network of 1,500 people in over 80 countries bringing together plant pathologists and entomologists and is building international multidisciplinary partnerships. This helps farmers and smallholders increase production and incomes, citizens have enough to eat, scientific researchers and their institutions to develop collaborations, policymakers and regulatory authorities to make better decisions based on evidence. Now, Connected needs to go further. We have started, but there is so much more to be done to build capacity in sub-Saharan Africa, embedding knowledge and skills to achieve our vision of sub-Saharan Africa, where existing and emerging vector-borne plant diseases are swiftly detected, fought, and defeated to ensure food security for all in the region. Okay, so those are just some of the resources that are available on the website. And just to finish off really, uh, by thinking about some of the things that are still ongoing with, with Connected. So um, we've got a conference uh, in June, uh, you can still register for this, go, go onto the website um, and attend this uh, new Connections uh, conference. Um, there's training resources that are available so you can do the online training um, and there's also the train the trainer program and then there's knowledge sharing so online seminars um, which are still occurring every uh, three months um, free access to chapters of the crops collection and a redesigned website which provides all of those resources that i just mentioned uh, to you uh, through the website so if you want to go on there you can take those you can use them in your own dissemination activities and then online network sessions. So these are the kind of activities uh, that are still ongoing for, for Connected at the moment. And I'm gonna just skip over the last uh, video because of time and just give you the uh, web address. So this is just a screenshot of the website. 
if you type in connected virus into a Google search, it'll take you straight there. Um, and we're pretty active also on Twitter, uh, so you can follow us there. And those are probably the best two channels um, to, in which you can um, get connected uh, to connected. Uh, so I'm going to end there, um, take some questions. Thank you so much, Nim. I enjoyed this uh, um, your presentation very much. I already knew uh, about some of the activities or many of the activities I would say of Connected because I've been stalking you for some time. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, I'm, I'm, I, I was uh, I enjoyed very much uh, um, the presentation on how you presented it in and how clear it was what you were doing. So just for clarification for the attendees. Uh, first, that it's no problem about the time, so we can stay longer if we have the questions and, and Neil has the ability. Uh, no problem from my side. Then if you have, uh, you want to post your questions, you have uh, three different ways to do that, depending on how shy you are. So you can use the uh, question and answer feature that it's below in the Zoom toolbar, or you can also, of course, use the chat box in a regular way or if you if you dare you can raise your hand and we'll open the microphone for you to post your question so uh while we wait for the question for the audience to come in because i think there is no question from the audience i was i have been checking so um i uh i think i missed it uh, probably you have presented it, but uh, I have uh, missed the timeline of the project. Uh, so I, I understood how, how you started and who was the team that was involved and how you did it. But when did this happen? And, and there is uh, also, I would be interested to know if Connected is still going. Uh, do you have another source of funding? Um. That's a good question because I can't remember the year that it started. Um, we so initially the grant was for a three-year project. Um, uh, thank you, Nina. Uh, so we started in 2017. And we were supposed to be for three years. Um, mm -hmm. The team worked really hard to to extend that uh, time. So you know we're still active now um, in 2022. Um, you know, and I think it, there's an interesting lesson here i think uh, around the funding agencies because you know things change and their priorities change in the first mm -hmm. instance uh, the gcrf program uh, had planned to run for three years and then the successful networks for a further three years to provide them with enough time to hopefully become self-sustaining but priorities changed at bbsrc uh, the GCRF program was withdrawn. Mm. And so we didn't get that second opportunity um, to fund the network through the BBSRC. And so we've had to look um, much more broadly. And as, as Nina's put in the chat there, um, we're predominantly currently funded by the Bristol Centre for Agricultural Innovation, uh, which is coming from, from Bristol University. Um, and it funds us until the summer of 2023. And we're actively looking all of the time for, you know, opportunities to to um, put this on a more sustainable footing, um, because you know there's clearly a need. Um, you know, we've got 1,500 members from all around the world, 80 different countries. You know, I think we must be delivering something that people are interested in. Um, but yeah, it's, it's these things can be quite challenging uh, to get from this kind of initial stage to the sustainable footing, you know, finding, I suppose, finding a home ultimately for it. Um, and so, yeah, as Nina said again in the chat, you know, we're open to collaboration from anybody. So, you know, if anybody has any ideas, please get in touch. Um, I've encountered this previously. I worked with a, with a kind of a network. It was, it was more to do with research uh, called Ufresco. It was initially funded by uh, the European Union and, you know, eventually found a home uh, within EPO. 
So EPO adopted the Ufresco uh, program mm -hmm. and continued to run it uh, as part of an EPO activity. So, um, you know, we know it's possible to do it. We just need to uh, keep plugging away. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we can put it on a sustainable footing. Uh, I assure you will. You will find a home. <laughs> A definitive home, I mean. Yeah. So I think you have commented it at the very beginning of your talk, but I want you to expand. What was first, the idea of the network or the grant call? The grant call. The grant call. Yeah. Although, you know, many of the networks, I think in some ways I look at Connected as being a network of networks. So many of those kind of networks kind of existed already through big collaborative projects. You know, so for example, I've been involved in a lot of big projects funded by the Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. And each of those forms a separate network, but often they're not very well linked together. Um, sure. Even though they come from the same funder, GCRF projects, again, you know, different sort of networks fund it, but again, they don't really overlap. Um, so, you know, connected enabled us to bring to, in many ways, join together those already pre-existing networks, some of which we knew about, some of which we didn't know about at all. So now I will take the time to remind the audience that they, they can post their own questions using the, the different, different channels, uh, either the, the feature, question and answers, the chat, or just by raising your hand. So next, and this is personal to me, I very much enjoyed you highlighting the communications and community management team because it's, uh, it's a rare thing. And then I really much enjoy you saying that, the, uh, that this has opened your eyes um, on how to manage research projects as well because uh, the uh, researchers are good at many things but not always on communication <laughs> and community man management. So how did you find this personnel, this key personnel? So you were looking for someone uh, with a background on science or a pure background on, communi on, on communication, a mixture? Well, I think um, there was a, I'm gonna say, well, there's probably a couple of things. Um, there's an element of luck. Um, there's an element of, um, you know, Gary was able to, to um, you know, is good at identifying people with talent, um, which is important. Um, so, you know, we, we can't, I, I suppose, we, it, you know, it started with Deanne. So Deanne uh, had already been working with Gary for many years. Um, and so she was the first member of our team. And then it, it kind of grew from there. Um, but yeah, it, there, there was luck in as much as, you know, we put out adverts and, pe you know, good people responded to those adverts. Uh, Gary was able to, you know, is a good pick of talent, I think, uh, was able to pick to get, you know, and there, there was luck, I think, to a degree in, I mean, obviously some of this is the, is clearly the personalities, but we got a team that really works well together, that really gels together. I mean, from my perspective, you know, in some way, it's, it's kind of almost a weird experience. I can talk to Deanne and Nina almost interchangeably and wouldn't necessarily even know exactly who I'm talking to because they work so well together. You know, it's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I've not seen a team um, like that previously. Um, as Deanne said, yeah, we advertise for a professional communications officer external to the university. Um, and yeah, as you said, you know, it really opened my eyes in a way to, and I think, I think it's the funders that really need to, to cotton on to this. You know, the, the funders don't often provide funding within their programs to employ people like this. So they mm -hmm. expect scientists to do it. And as you mentioned, you know, we don't have, I don't have skills in communication. That's not my background. Um, and then, you know, when, when you see uh, people like Richard operate, um, then you see how it can be done properly. Mm -hmm. And you think, and then, 
I mean, why that's an eye opener, I have no idea because it's it's obvious, isn't it? In many ways, you know, you just think, well, yeah, why why haven't we always done this? And why doesn't all why don't all projects do this? You know, funders want to see dissemination, they want to see outreach, they want to see impact from the work that they fund, yet they don't want really to fund the activities that would enable that. And that's a, I think that's a huge mistake by the fund funders and I think they need to you know to get get with that idea you mm -hmm. know that you can't expect non-specialists to do specialist roles um, mm -hmm. and if you want things to be managed effectively and communicated effectively then you should employ people with the right skills to do it and I... that is why ultimately why connected was successful and why it was more successful than the other networks that were set up at the same time you know, if you measure success in terms of the number of participants, the, the extent of the activities uh, that we brought together was because we employed a team that was capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. And do you know if the other networks are still ongoing? Um, I don't actually know. I know one of them has certainly ended. Mm -hmm. I, th I think they've all ended, but um, maybe Diane or Nina will jump into the chat there um yeah yes i think so uh, uh, says diane that was my understanding is that that they they kind of ended um they didn't generate the kind of momentum again and it, that was the team so mm -hmm. all of the other networks were very much um driven by the science leads so they had two or three science leads mm -hmm. um and they delivered the activities that, that they set out to deliver. Um, but, you know, they didn't employ a team in the way that we did, and it, it didn't develop that kind of momentum in the way that Connected did. Mm -hmm. But I understand that did you have uh, that you did have the flexibility from your funder, because uh, um, I understood that the, uh, you changed path at, at some point at the very beginning, uh, that you decided to focus on early uh, career researchers, that, that that was not written down in the proposal? Yes, so we, we were kind of trying to, you know, it's quite difficult to do, I think sometimes, but again, we were, we, we were able to do it here, um, was, you know, it's quite often you would like to, in a proposal say, we're gonna decide this later, mm -hmm. but lots of funders don't like that. They want certainty about what you're going to deliver. Um, and we managed to, I think picture it in such a way that we we knew the kinds of activity that we would do. So we knew we would do training, and we knew the training would probably be quite broad, both involving lab lab skills, field skills, soft skills. Um, but we didn't detail it too much, um, and we didn't certainly didn't detail it in terms of who we would deliver that to. Um, so there was that kind of flexibility in the program to enable us to. To kind of change course a little bit mm -hmm. um, i think the research funding again we we had decided that we would we would look at pump prime funding because i think it was important that the funders knew what that we would spend our money um wisely but i think also engaging a big management team and the governance was helpful from that regard too so we weren't saying to them saying to the funder you know, oh, well, it's, it's me and Gary and, you know, don't worry about it. We'll spend your money wisely. You know, <laughs> we set up this management team saying, well, actually, we're not going to really decide very much. We're going to come up with options and the management team will decide what we fund. And I think that governance, that was specifically commented on when we were interviewed. Uh, so mm -hmm. this program was a two-stage application process on paper followed by an interview. And at the interview, yeah, they specifically talked about the management and governance, um, which we'd pulled together. So I think that gave them the confidence that we could be a bit flexible because their money were, was in safe hands. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, I think that experience, it's a uh, great advice for others when, when planning their, uh, I mean, it depends a little bit of the, of the funders of giving that uh, kind of flexibility, but uh, uh, showing it in actions written on paper 
that mm. yeah, you will, um, we have a, a way of deciding that this it doesn't really depend on just one person. Yeah, it's a, it's a great advice. So I'm, I will take now the time to remind the audience that they can post their questions on the chat. We have, we have a couple of messages, uh, but the, there are not questions. There is a very nice comment by Priska. Uh, so I, if you haven't read it, Neil, I, I advise you to do it. It's a nice one. Thank you. Uh -huh. So there is also a comment from Nina, having such a diverse and experienced management board has really helped us co-create unique in the interdisciplinary impactful activities. And also you mentioned that there is, you didn't um, decide your activities only um, from a um, um, top-down approach, but also you took suggestions from the, from the members of the network, so bottom up. Yeah. So can you comment on the activities that were suggested from, from the users of the network? Uh, in some cases, that was um, really refining ideas. So, you know, for example, we would have, we, we had act, these kind of workshop sessions, um, say in our launch events, where we would talk about, you know, in the Uganda event, for example, um, we talked about training. And we had a, a, an afternoon workshop. Um, and again, we'd managed to get a diversity of, of people along to that workshop and say, okay, what, what kind of activities, you know, what, what kind of topics and how you would want them delivered? Mm -hmm. Because I think the two things are really important. It, you know, it's easy to think in a binary sense, oh, we're gonna do training. So we run a training course. What should be the content of that course? But, you know, as Nina's, said in the chat there you know we those things enabled us to co-create the activities so not just the topics and say well okay diagnostics and identification is important but how we would deliver it so training courses training vouchers um attending courses these kind of you know different activities mm -hmm. um, that enabled people to access training in the way they wanted to do it so you know running training courses both in the UK because that had some benefits, but also, you know, in Kenya and, and Nigeria, but also allowing people to make use of their own networks, you know, go to the US, go to South Africa. Um, and, you know, and in another big activity that we did was from a connection in our management board. Some of the one thing that came up in a lot from a lot of our early career researchers was bioinformatics, mm -hmm. you know, it's a new subject it's quite challenging to get into how can we deliver bioinformatics training? And, you know, one of our management board members said, well, oh, I've got a, a colleague who works in Sweden and runs this massive bioinformatics program every year. Do you want me to talk to them and see if we can get reduced or free access to this? And he managed to negotiate um, reduced costs for a couple of people every year on that program. And that was, you know, probably one of the world's best bioinformatics programs. Mm -hmm. um, and it came about because we happened to have that person on our management board. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it, I think it helped having quite a sizable management board. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as always in these kind of, of collaborative uh, projects, I would say that networking is key. So knowing the right people. <laughs> And again, that was sort of networks of networks. So, you know, in the first instance, it was, you know, myself, Gary and Sue and our networks. But then we were open to those people saying, you know, well, who do you want to bring in to? Who do you suggest that we engage with? So then, that it, you know, you get that kind of snowball effect. Mm -hmm. So we ha I have another question here. Um... Remember, audience, uh, you can post your question whenever you want. You are still in time. Um, so you have said that there are members of the network from 85 countries. So I assume uh, there are members outside the UK and the African continent. So what is there in the, in the network for them? Why uh, it would be, I mean, I know, but I want you to explain. 
what is in connected that could be useful for them? Um, I think the key, probably the key thing is these days is no science is done in isolation. Um, I mean, at the start of my career, which is now like 25 years ago, um, it was kind of already rare, I would say, you know, there were still grants available, people would apply by themselves and deliver it by themselves. You know, 25 years on now, I can't think of a single project that I work on that's just me. Everything is collaborative. Um, you know, most things are interdisciplinary. Um, and so, you know, to do that, you need a network. You know, to get anywhere, you need that, that kind of network. And Connected, I think, you know, provides that network. Um, so it provides some tools and resources, the training materials and, you know, these kind of nice things that you can access by joining the, the net, by joining Connected, and you can access them on the website, but it also provides you with the network of people, you know, 1500 people that you can engage with um, to build your own collaborations, find expertise, um, and this kind of thing. So, you know, there's a directory of those uh, members on the website that you can access mm -hmm. um, and you can, you know, and I think that's the most important thing here. And I think that that's one of the reasons why it's been successful um, in particular for, I remember the start of my career, you know, people would say this to me like, oh yeah, you must get out there. You must network with people. I mean, frankly, I found that the thought of that terrifying, mm -hmm. um, you know, and how do you do it? I mean, how do you pull together a, collabor a collaborative team to do something? And how do you find these people? I just couldn't understand that leap from a new postdoctoral researcher. And then I would look at other people and, who had a network and think, well, how do I get from here to here? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that came through in the feedback from early career researchers. Can you help us to do that? And I think Connected provides lots of tools and activities that enable people to get, um, I hate saying the word connected a lot, but <laughs> to get connected with lots of other people in the field and provide that network for them and give them that kind of leg up. And also, I suppose, different ways of doing that. You know, everybody does it differently. Some people, you know, can walk into a room at a conference and just walk, walk up to people and shake their hand and introduce themselves. Um, that's never been me. I can't do mm -hmm. that. That's not my. Uh, it's not my comfort zone. Um, but you know, being able to access a directory, and phone people up or email people individually, and build my networks in a bit more of a low key fashion that I'm more comfortable with, um, you know, is something that's really worked for me over my career. Um, and you know, connected delivers that I think for people. Mm -hmm. I I agree. Uh, Nina and Diane, they, they are writing in the chat. So Diane highlights the, as you, as you did as well, the directory of all network members, searchable directory. And then also the access to the online resources that uh, some of them you have commented, others you haven't, like the protocols, the infographics, uh, and so on. And then Nina also highlights the monthly newsletters uh, that I received, so I can I can testify that, that there, there are very useful newsletters and the regular online research seminars and other events. So, uh, yeah. So I, I think we we have covered <laughs> everything that Connected has to offer <laughs> to researchers in the UK, in Africa, or any other any other place, and also the communications training help network members here too, how to prevent yourself online, how, uh, how to present yourself online, how to contact people, how to explain your work to others in 20 seconds. And, and yes, I've, I've attended some of these uh, seminars. And again, I can, I can uh, testify that they are not quite good, but uh, excellent. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, you know, it's also, I, you know, I mentioned, the two-way arrow from the network to to everybody too because you know it's, I think it's also easy to to slip into this idea that you know networking is a one-way thing of early career researchers networking with senior researchers but you know clearly 
it's also the other way around too. You know, we need, you know, of course. I need to network with the next generation of, of researchers too. You know, otherwise my career will just kind of fizzle out at some point. You know, I need to, you need to continue to refresh your network. And mm -hmm. it's been great for me in that regard to, to build my network through, you know, you know, even where I've been say delivering training events, it is also about networking. And build. Mm, of course. Uh, last comment from Diane. We had lots of feedback from network members saying that they had not received communications trainings in their own institution. And so it was very valuable for them that uh, we were able to offer this. I'm sure, I'm sure. I'm sure that's true because it's also, it also happened to me while um, studying, so. It's still a, a, a common place in many places, many um, institutions. So um, I think if we don't have any more questions, I, I, we have gone through all my, uh, my whole list. So uh, from my side, I, this uh, will be it. Thank you so much, Neil and Diane and Nina and all the others who have a, a attended so just to finish uh, let you know that the next month we have another another seminar a webinar uh, this case on 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 soft skills by delivered by the global plan council so this will be on the changing landscape of peer review in plant science so i'm going to post here in the chat box the link to the registration if you will be interested and and okay, thank you again, Neil, for your time. It was great. <laughs> no worries. Thank you for um, organizing and for everybody for attending. So I'm going to stop the recording.